a familiar section of the Bible that tells us to fight the good fight. But listen, listen to the Apostle Paul who, who talks about the difficulties of ministry, embracing the cross, and yet anticipating the crown that is to come. From 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season or out of season. In other words, there's a time when it'll be appreciated and a time when it's not. But keep preaching. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Remember, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, a, a, a young pastor, and he's giving him words of encouragement for ministry. He's not sparing him any details, telling him it's not always going to be easy. Just keep preaching. It says, for a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you... You keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of the evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For me, the Apostle Paul, realized, died in Rome at the time that Nero was persecuting. We're not exactly sure how the Apostle Paul died, but it was in Rome during the time of Nero. We have some pretty good guesses. I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. And here's how he summed up his life, and this is going to be the, the focus of our devotion this morning. One of the awesome sections of Scripture. By the way, I'll just add a personal note. As a pastor, it's difficult for me to preach on some of the powerful verses of the Bible. Difficult because I, I feel like they really deserve a powerful message. But finally, I need to step back and let God speak. Let his words be the power, not me. Paul, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. And now there is in store for me, catch it, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that last day. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Something that... Uh, that I'd like to maybe start out by talking with the, with the kids and help them to see what it is that we're going to be looking at in our, in our devotion with adults. So here's a game that sometimes is, is used with kids to help, to help them to see that they should start thinking about what comes next, right? So if you look at the blank, you, you're supposed to fill in the blank. You're supposed to think to yourself, what comes next? So they have the alphabet here. A, B, C, D, E. That's what comes next. And then F, G, H, I, J, K. That's what comes next. And you can look through the whole list and, and start to help to get a thought of what comes next. But it's important in your life that you also start to realize what comes next. And you know what comes next after training wheels. A bike with maybe only, with maybe only two wheels. What comes next 
if you're in school and you've, and you've gone through addition, what might come next? Multiplication. And it's good for you to start thinking of what, what could come next. If your ball goes rolling out into the street, your parents want you to think about what comes next. Or what could come next? What could come next is a car coming down the road. Be careful. We don't just run out into the road because of what might come next. Or if you're at the pool during this summer and the pool floor area is wet and you start running along the pool area with that wet spot, you should think to yourself, what could come next? It's wet. It's slippery. What could come next is I would fall and that would hurt. You see, so it's important for us to start thinking about what comes next. And the Apostle Paul is going to help us in our conversation today to start thinking, even as adults, of what comes next. So let's look at those words once again in the next slide. And as I said, we'd really like to center on those words that are in yellow. See, he talks about his departure being near. He believes he's at the end of his life. But he, he wants Timothy not to fear that thought. So he says, I've, I've fought the good fight. That's what our last hymn was about. I finished the race. I kept the faith. That's how he summarizes his life. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for, to all who have faith in, uh, in the Lord as they look forward to his appearing. So, now, let's look ahead to the next slide that points us as adults to knowing that there's a time in which we need to think about what happens next. Because sometimes what happens next is, is so very important. We get handed the keys to our first car. Wonderful, but what happens next is pretty important because now I've got to take care of the car, I've got to put gas in it, and I, and I have to insure it. And, and now the the caring for that car becomes a very important step. Sometimes we plan our weddings, and the wedding is just this wonderful event, but we forget to plan about marriage and how it's going to take some work in, in, in making sure that we have a successful marriage and how we're always communicating and working through issues and, and, that, and that the problems of life are not going to pull us apart but bring us together. You're wearing your graduation gown, but what comes next? Because what comes next is now a career and a life and, and how we're going to serve our Lord in, in, in the various career that, that we've chosen for our life. It's, it's more than graduation because what comes next is the most important part. So we think about what comes next. That's important. So this next slide is going to make us stop and think. Because not often do we think about what happens next. Some people will think ahead to plan their funerals. But they forgot to think about what happens next. Forgot to think about what happens after we pass away. Because, well, the Bible, the Bible tells us that if we go to a funeral, you know, we maybe have an opportunity to pause, to think about ourselves. Who's, who's going to be next? Am I going to be next? Am I prepared for, for that day and for that future? Maybe going to a funeral makes us stop and pause, and that's not such a bad thing. But some people will argue when we as Christians will describe what happens next. And they'll say, well, you believe that, I, I believe something else. I find that similar to arguing 
math, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, just because we may believe something else doesn't mean that what you believe is accurate. And so when we tell about what Scripture tells us about what happens next, it's what God has told us to be the truth. And that's going to be so important. The Apostle Paul has described his ministry as a fight and as a race, two sporting events. But coming through the fight and, and, and finishing the race, but in all of the difficulty of life, well, he kept the faith. And he held on to the truth that he, in his ministry, was trying to point out. He's trying to point out the doctrines of the Bible. He's trying to point out the promises of God. He's trying to point out sin, but sin that's paid for through Jesus Christ. He's trying to bring the truth. But now, all of that is finished. And he's kept the faith, and he's kept the ministry, and... And now, you see, now is what happens next. And, and this is the word that jumps out at me as I read, as I read the, the text here for today and these, these verses. He's telling us about things that have happened. I fought, I finished, I kept. And now what's next? What happens next? And he tells us so clearly what it is that he is looking forward to. When we start to think about what's next, for some people they will quickly analyze their health. But I put up a question on this. It says, is your health in your body? How are you going to answer that question? If your answer is no, well then, where is your health? The, the psalmist of Psalm 73 says, my strength, my strength, and my heart may fail. So he's coming right out to say, where is his health, you know? Is it in my strength? Is it in my heart? And he says, no. My strength in my heart never held my real strength. He goes on to say, but the Lord is my strength and my portion, meaning my inheritance. The Lord is my strength. Strength was never in bodily health. Strength was in his faith. So, so now we think about a guarantee that our Lord has given to us. He guaranteed that he had a place for you. I love the picture because it describes for us a puzzle with one piece missing. And that piece is you. You're the one piece missing in our Father's plan for eternity. He promised, he guaranteed that he has a, a place for you. Let me pretend for a moment. Now this is completely figurative, completely made up. But let me just pretend for a moment what it's going to be like when I enter into heaven. I'm going to imagine that I have an angel who's going to welcome me into heaven. That angel's name is maybe going to be Stephen. When you think of heaven yourself, go ahead and picture your own angel with a different name. But we're pretending for a moment. And so Stephen Gray comes to me and says, hey, before you go on in, I, I, I want you to come with me. Gotta, I've got to help you with, uh, with a little bit of hospitality first. Let's go to the fitting rooms. Fitting rooms? Never heard of fitting rooms in heaven? Well, sure. But remember that the Bible told you that you were going to receive a glorified body. Well, let's go get fitted for it. Okay, glorified body. What else do I need to get fitted for? Well, another Bible promise is that you're going to wear a robe of righteousness. I got one right for you. Come with me. 
that fit you with your crown of, with your robe of righteousness. Hey, now there's something else that you need to wear, and that's you need to be fitted for your crown. Remember, the Bible promised you a crown of righteousness and a crown of life. Let's go get that. And then I've got one final thing for you. Here's your keys. It's the keys to your heavenly mansion. It's the keys to the place that the Lord has prepared for you. You've got your keys. And then he looks at me and says, it's time to go meet your Savior. Let's go meet the Lord. And I drop my head and I think to myself, do you know, Stephen, just a moment ago, I thought this was the worst day of my life. Because it was the last day on earth. And now, and now I think and I know this is the best day of my life. As we talk about ministry, it is one of the joys of ministry to be able to share these thoughts, to tell people you know that there is a fountain of youth that Ponce de Leon was looking for, but he looked in the wrong place. He wasn't looking in the words of Scripture and in the Gospel message. I know where the fountain of youth is, and it's in these words, it's in these words of Jesus. So I can tell people who are grieving, I can say to them, your loved one may have experienced the worst day of their life, but in one moment, they are experiencing the best day of their life. Ministry for me is a joy that I would encourage anyone to, to think about, any of our youth to think about. Put it this way. I do all the things that the Lord has asked all Christians to do. I get to be involved in the study of God's word, but he asked that for all of us. I get, I get to tell people about sin and grace, but he told all of us to do that. I get to encourage people in the truths of the Lord, but he asked all of us to do that. And I get paid for it. I feel like I'm cheating. Like that's not quite fair. I'm doing everything all of you guys are doing. I'm getting paid for it. How is that fair? But this is the blessing of ministry. Ministry for pastors, for, for teachers alike. We have opportunity to to find the joy in the ministry that the, Lord, that the Lord has given to us. The next slide helps us to, to realize with the promises of the Lord behind us and with us and holding us up, we are now inspired in our faith. We throw out a question to you. Where are the two most famous graves in the United States? Tell me who they might be. Anybody just throw out an answer. Did I, did I hear Elvis for one of them? That's a correct answer. And I've already given you the other one. JFK. The two most famous graves. Now, there's famous graves around the world. You've got the pharaohs in the pyramids. You've, you've got the politicians and, uh, and soldiers in Arlington where Kennedy is, Westminster Abbey uh, for, the, for the British. Just as a side note, I didn't realize that there's 3,300 graves inside of Westminster Abbey. Can you imagine 30 of them being kings and queens? Famous, famous graves. But one one person who's outside of the Christian faith said, you know, when we want to celebrate our faith, we can go to a cemetery and we can celebrate our faith at this cemetery. You Christians, you don't even have a cemetery that you can go to. But the Christian answer is, that's the whole point. Our Savior's grave is empty. 
Because he lives. And he promised us that because he lives, we too will live. And that inspires our faith. We know that to be true. Now these promises of the Lord and this crown of righteousness also inspires us in, a, in the thought of peace. Now, I pulled up a picture that does anything but inspire peace. This is a picture, a, a, a real picture, from Venezuela over a swamp that is said to contain a lot of methane gas. So when lightning strikes here, there's like explosions going on. This is nothing like peace. Would you like to be out on a, a, a rowboat out, out on the water here? That would be terrifying. Sometimes life is like that. One person one, once said to me, Pastor, you may experience joy in ministry, but I don't ever envy you when you have to go to a cemetery in difficult situations where families are being ripped apart. It must be terrible to go to a hospital and talk to a person who's been given, given such terrible news. I don't envy you for going to stand along someone who's having the worst day of their life. And that may be true, but I have the answer for them. I have the help that they need. And the words of the Lord, certainly not my words. <coughs> They're words of the Lord. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear me. They want to hear, what does God say? Is the Lord going to be standing with me? And here's God's word that says, never will I leave you. And never will I forsake you. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. He says, you're the apple of my eye. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And God is our refuge and our strength and an ever-present help in trouble. I know that the crown and the promises of the Lord Bring me peace. I can fight the good fight. I can finish the race. Know that with the strength of the Lord, I've finished, I've finished that race and have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. And it inspires me with peace. And the next frame tells me that that crown inspires my view of life everlasting. There was a woman who once did not believe in the resurrection, did not believe in Jesus Christ, and, and wanted by all means to avoid this whole resurrection thing. So she f asked her relatives, seal her up in cement. Wrap the steel cables around it. Make sure that no resurrection will find me. But a little crack came through the cement, just a little crack, and a seed fell into the little crack. This is a true story. And over the course of time and years, that tree grew and, well, pulled that cement tomb wide open. For us as believers, I find that there is, a, that, that there is words of encouragement. But the Lord is going to find us, no matter where we are and what the condition of these bodies are going to be. His promise is, is mine. That promise is, is that he will open the doors of my grave and bring me to heaven with himself. And finally, as we look at the next slide here, we'll see that there is a booklet that is our synodical a uh, booklet for the, uh, for the Synod Convention coming up. As I said, embrace the cross and anticipate the crown. All basically the thoughts of this, this sermon today and our, and our thoughts for this message. Embrace the cross. There's going to be difficult moments. 
but I know that the crown awaits me and joy is mine. As our synod meets in convention, they're, they're going to talk about home missions and, and the encouragement that, uh, that, our, that our synod has to reach out and, and begin 100 new missions in the next 10 years. A daunting task. As we look to world missions, we're, in, we're welcoming two new synods that were previously not in our fellowship. One, uh, one the Obadiah Lutheran Church in Uganda and, uh, and Academia Christ, no, uh, um, uh, a, Latin, a Latin church in Latin America that we're going to welcome into our fellowship from there. Our church is growing. Our church is growing a lot outside of the United States. And, and we say, how can we, how can we start 100 new churches? We have a shortage of pastors. Well, first of all, that's reasons to pray and encourage our youth and those who might consider ministry as a second career. But you should also know that we have 80 more pastors than we had 10 years ago. And so, yes, there may be a shortage, but I pray we're always asking for more pastors. I pray we're always looking for more. I pray we're always trying to reach out. I pray we're always trying to grow. Because the best is yet to come. One final story that I'll share with you. It was a, it was a lady, and maybe some of you have heard this story before, but a lady was holding a fork in her casket to the people who came up to view her. Some of you have heard this story. You know where this is going. But some people were appalled. Why is she holding a fork in her hand? And it's because she said, and she wanted people to know, you know how the host picks up the dishes as she clears the table? The host might say to you, hold on to your fork. What does that mean? It means dessert is coming. It means that maybe the best part of the whole meal is still coming. So when she was holding on to her fork, those of you who know my mom said the same thing. You can put a fork in my hand, I'm okay. The best part, as you hold on to, as she held on to the fork in her hand, she wanted people to know her faith was that the best is yet to come. So we fought finished, we kept the faith, and now the crown of righteousness. The best is yet to come. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.